that. All right, thank you all. And uh, uh, it's, it's really great to be with uh, so many friends. Uh, and thanks, Yang, for organizing this and giving us opportunity to, uh, uh, to talk about various things that, uh, that we're doing. And um, what I've been doing the last, uh, I would say, eight years um, is uh, a, a sort of a new way of thinking about quantum gravity that initially, it was not the starting point. The starting point was more like uh, understanding uh, uh, something about foundations of string theory, but it turned out to sort of uh, go from very foundations of quantum mechanics um, via uh, something called quantum or modular space time, and then go uh, towards quantum field theory and all the way to quantum gravity. And uh, what we want to do, of course, is solve, well, or understand it a little bit, <laughs> or start understanding um, uh, this uh, problem that was left from 20th century physics, right, which is the unification of the fundamental constants, which apparently happens in quantum uh, when you combine quantum uh, principles with uh, gravitational physics. And one thing that always bothered me and probably bothers a lot of you about our research is very sophisticated and technical, but unlike the research uh, of people who did in the 60s and the 70s, it doesn't really immediately connect to uh, observe reality. Now, of course, you know sometimes it takes time um, to uh, do these things, but we've been doing this for a long time. I've been in graduate school uh, 88 to 93, uh, you know, with Joe Polchinski and Weinberg, and they're both gone, unfortunately. And here we are, you know, in 2021, we're not really connecting much uh, to observe reality. We try, of course, but, um, and so I would like also to say something about quantum gravity phenomenology and maybe surprising in the infrared. When you combine this uh, H bar G, Newton and C, you get minimal length, minimal time, and they're not really accessible, but uh, large distances are. And I would like to claim in some sense that we do have a phenomenology for quantum gravity and we've been having for 20 years Unfortunately, we don't explore the quantum aspect of this, and that's the discovery of dark energy. In some sense, uh, if you model dark energy cosmological constant, then uh, you have a gravitational aspect. Obviously, it's a parameter in uh, Einstein's equations, and then the vacuum energy aspect. Um, and there's a recent uh, essay that was awarded the second prize by the uh, 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 Gravity Research Foundation that I wrote with Laurent, Yerji, and uh, Rob Lee that uh, tries to explore further um, uh, that very simple observation. Now, of course, with the gravitational wave uh, astronomy and uh, multi-messenger astronomy, I think our chances for getting something um, more precise and sharper in this respect are should increase in the next 10 years. Uh, now, we, uh, with Loran and Rob, uh, um, we have written a bunch of papers um, on the subject. And in, in the last couple of years, Jerzy kowalski glickman joined us. And uh, we learned, Rob, we introduced a new concept, we we'll tried to explain board geometry, model space-time, metastring, and um, uh, also uh, zero modes of the metastring that we explored with Yerji called metaparticles. And then with uh, Doug Edmonds, who is an astronomer, and Tatsu Takuchi, who is a high-energy physicist, they tried to talk about uh, uh, observation constant in dark matter. And with Pear and Tristan, uh, uh, string theories, we've been talking about dark energy, uh, a writing paper in dark energy, in particular, the sitter space, and in string theory from this point of view. I've tried to write a little review. Uh, this is an ongoing research, so I put the archive number um, up there. And the main message here, after the dust settled, <laughs> since 2018, at least for me, is that in some sense, there is something like quantum relativity here, where quantum mechanics is essentially some type of special quantum relativity, but you have to rewrite it uh, from a point of view that's not in the textbooks. Uh, from a point of view that I'll try to explain using quantum space time, where a new geometry called Born geometry uh, emerges and where locality is defined in some quantum mechanical form, but it's relative. The same, uh, uh, in other words, it's observer dependent. You can extend this to quantum field theory, and then you find out that the quantum field theory that we think we all know and love, right? And, and, and we do many technical, wonderful things with it actually has some parts that we haven't really understood um, and actually predictions for us uh, that we call metaparticles and that, that could be extended uh, to quantum gravity and uh, in the formulation which sort of maybe answers the question what is string theory which is called metastring and applied in the real world to dark matter and dark energy by a dynamical quantum space time. Of course that reminds you of classical relativity or special relativity based on two axioms gave us Minkowski geometry where an aspect of classical physics, pre-relativistic called simultaneity, absoluteness of time, 
was made relativistic. So we have relative simultaneity where that was applied to classical field theory, right? And in particular in the quantum context with a classic that uses classical space time still, representation Lorentz group gave us particles and of course the prediction of antiparticles and, uh, and uh, the extension of special relativity in the context of dynamical uh, space time that's local Minkowski gave us general relativity. And all this has wonderful uh, connection to reality. Now I'll start with quantum mechanics with something kind of colloquial <laughs> uh, like, which is the origin of quantum mechanics, Ella Schrodinger. As you know, it goes back to this 19th century observation uh, uh, connection between geometric optics and wave uh, and and geometric uh, and uh, a particle mechanics. So ray part ray is sort of a particle, and then ray, which is a, a sort of a, a limit of a wave, uh, has an analog on the particle side into some uh, quantum wave. And the iconal, the phase of the wave, becomes the action, but the action is dimensionful. Iconal is dimensionless, and so one has to introduce a unit. Uh, of action, and that's precisely um, uh, what H bar does for us. The variation of the iconal, um, right, gives us the uh, geometric path, like in the famous uh, problem that goes way back to the Greeks, right, the, the minimal distance that you find of all possible paths between uh, our, uh, uh, points A and B and the mirror, uh, parameterized C, C prime, and C double prime. Um, uh, essentially, you just take the image, connect to B, and we know it's a minimum time, or actually minimum uh, iconal. That becomes the minimum of the action. It was all known to Hamilton. And in the wave uh, context, well, in, you know, in 1920s, uh, 1926 was figured out by, um, by Schrodinger that this old 19th century observation carries an important message that though I could write an analog of the, of the wave, but now not the exponent of the eye of the iconal, but the exponent i of the action over h bar. And that immediately Hamilton equation becomes immediately the Schrodinger equation, at least intuitively. And the Schrodinger, that means that the, the wave function is weighed by e to the i s over h bar, which later was analyzed by Dirac and then used uh, by Feynman to reformulate quantum mechanics, as John mentioned, as the sum of a pass with this exponent i s over h bar uh, limit. But you see, it's all very classical discussion. Right. I mean, we start with the sort of classical uh, notions, uh, action, and so forth, and then we cook up our quantum mechanics. But suppose now that we start with our physics, define on a lattice, let's say discrete space time. And this lattice space time is classical, even though our physics is quantum, and let's say defined in terms of the path. So we put it on the computer, right? We sum over this uh, e to the i of h bar s. It's usually very hard because the phases are hard to sum. So we do a Euclidean and then we rotate back, et cetera, like was reviewed by, uh, by John in this talk. And you know, in order to define a, com uh, a continuum limit, we have to apply some sophisticated thing called normalization that essentially uh, our physics observables do not depend on how we discretize this path integral. But anyway, we work with the lattice and we basically try to do this path integral on a lattice and essentially define non-perturbative physics this way. Now, the main insight here is essentially that in quantum theory, we need a lattice and it's dual, okay? I don't know if, uh, so, um, uh, okay, Alara sent me a message, okay? Bye-bye, Alara. -bye, um, so, in, in, in quantum theory, we need a lattice and it's dual. And that was pointed out by uh, an Israeli uh, 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 solid state physicist, Zach, uh, who's a technician, I think still alive, uh, who was at MIT back in the 60s. And it's a very simple observation. Essentially, if I give you a lattice, I can give you translation operators U on the lattice, but then there is a dual translation operator V. These are what we call clock and shift operators in the context of quantum field theory, et cetera. And as it's well known, these operators commute. See, they exist on the lattice. One knows about the lattice. The other one knows about the dual lattice, but they commute, even though Qs and Ps satisfy the Heisenberg algebra. Now, um, some reason, I have a problem moving. Okay, let's see. Okay, so now uh, uh, let's define following Aharonov, um, uh, who was inspired by, by this insight, um, operators, which are Hermitian operators, right? So essentially what Zach is telling us, don't work with a complete basis of Hermitian operators, but with a complete basis of unitary operators. Okay, so which we can do. Okay, and now it seems like the pay, uh, that we have doubled, right? Because we have this commuting operator, so obviously we need 
both the lattice and the dual lattice data in order to describe our physics form. So now, uh, notice in the continuum limiting principle, the dual lattice goes away. So once we work with the uh, classical space and we assume it, we're doomed. <laughs> there is no dual lattice, we never see it. But let's stick with this lattice, uh, lattice size description and the dual lattice, and then uh, go to the Hermitian basis. And that's basically what Harano did. It defines something which is called modular operators. You see, these are Hermitian operators define modular the lattice data and the inverse lattice data. And you can do a computation, and Aharonov has it in his book by, with Rolich, that essentially the UV commutator equals zero, right? And the, com, the zero commutator, the translations on the lattice and the dual lattice essentially is the zero commutator of the modular Q and modular P. But you see the modular variables depend on the lattice data, okay? Unlike the usual emission operators. So modular operators are actually no local from the point of view Right, if you were to think that the lattice is, let's say, uh, A, right, the lattice spacing is defined in terms of the fundamental length, which is given in terms of square root of G Newton H bar over C, whatever, cube, and something like that, let's call it lambda, and then the inverse of that length in the units, uh, in some sense, the De Broglie wavelength, the, the energy corresponding to the Planck clock. So modular variables are covariant also. You see, you can do this also for time and energy. Remember, we cannot do this for time and energy in quantum mechanics, right? Because we assume that there is a vacuum in a system. If time were to commute with energy, then we could shift the energy. There will be no vacuum. Because we want the vacuum to exist, time cannot be an operator. Usual in quantum mechanics, the old argument of Pauli. Therefore, time is a parameter. Therefore, when you covariantize everything in quantum field theory, x, y, z, that means the whole space time, is just the parameter. It's a classical label for quantum fields for operators. However, here we're working with labels that are quantum labels and they commute and they're covariant, okay? So modular time and modular energy can be introduced at the age bar is just the lambda times epsilon where, uh, right, the epsilon is sort of Planck length if lambda is, I'm sorry, Planck energy if lambda is the Planck length. Now look at, see, at this explicit non locality in the very simple computation. Okay, just take the Hamiltonian P squared 2M plus the uh, potential and try to do this for the modular variables, the Heisenberg, Born, Heisenberg, or Jordan equations of motion. And then essentially what you find out is that you have some type of discretized version, operatorial discretized version, or what you would call the classical equations. But you see there is this parameter R, right, that enters, let's say, in your uh, in the definition of modular variables, right? It's some contextuality parameter. Could be your double slit experiment parameter, for example. So reformulate quantum mechanics using this modular variables and essentially you get a notion of modular quantum space time. And what is it mathematically precisely? Q and P uh, are not equal, you know, commutator is IH bar, that's the wild Heisenberg algebra. But if you take UV, the exponents of Q and P on the lattice and the dual lattice, they commute. So let's look at the commuting subalgebra of the Weyl Heisenberg algebra. That essentially gives you modular space time. That's a self dual lattice that is lifted to Weyl Heisenberg. And it's known in mathematics since the 50s through the work of Mackey, famous uh, functionalist from Harvard. Now, notice that there is a lattice and a dual lattice. So, therefore, there is some structure here which is sort of doubly orthogonal. Obviously, we have a commutator and a symplectic structure. We have a kind of discretized phase space. So we have a symplectic structure. We have a doubly orthogonal. And it turns out to define vacuum, we, have a, uh, we need a conformal double metric. And the overlap of these three, which we call Born geometry, elements of Born geometry, essentially gives us Lorentz, which is consistent with, which tells you that you could define causality, at least classically. So quantum mechanics is essentially non-locality that is wedded to causality. The same way special relativity is a constancy of uh, velocity C and Galilean relati and, and, uh, relativity, right? The physics essentially is the same in all inertial frames, okay? Non-locality here is essentially representing fundamental length. So fundamental length, time plus Lorentz gives you quantum mechanics. But this tell tells you that relative, uh, uh, that locality is defined um, relative to an observer, because you see, you have to reconcile fundament, the presence of long fundamental length with Lorentz, because you would say the different you know, observers would see different fundamental lengths if they just boost. So different observers probe different space times. In other words, different slices of modular space time. 
So in other words, what you have is kind of the discrete covariant phase space-like structure. On the horizontal, you space time. On the vertical, you have a dual space time. The commuting module of variables tell you that you can be in a phase space cell. That's the origin of locality. However, you cannot tell in which one. That's the origin of Heisenberg uncertainty, or what we usually call non-locality in the quantum context. So modular space time is a discrete covariant phase space, right? Um, right in the, in the sense of the, having the symplectic structure lifted to Weyl Heisenberg algebra. On the horizontal here is X and the vertical is X tilde. Dual space time. So essentially we're predicting that there is a dual space time the qu in quantum mechanics, and then X and X tilde don't commute. And in principle, you can put, pick any polarization you want. We pick a fine tuned polarization we call X, we call the classical space time, but we could be in any and it's relative to an observer. And this will have experimental consequences. Actually, these dual space-time labels essentially are the intrinsic hidden covariant uh, labels or variables that then address from the quantum mechanics point of view without any interpretation, intrinsically the measurement problem. So analogy with spin here is the spin is discrete, but it does not break S3 due to superposition principle, my dual space-time discrete, but it does not break Lorentz due to superposition principle. You can also invent the modular polarization because now you see that the Schrodinger polarization is uh, singular. Take the Schrodinger, lattice size it. Let's say for any problem you have already solved, okay? Hydrogen atom, if you could do QCD, QCD, and then basically take this Fourier sum. Now, from the information point of view, uh, this is actually optimal discretization. There are proofs about this, about Zach transform in information uh, theory literature. And, but you can see that it's bilocal and X and X don't have to commute. And in principle, again, from this point of view, Schrodinger polarization in which you basically take lambda to go to zero is extremely singular, okay? And the projection axiom of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, von Neumann appears, even though mathematically true for finite Hilbert spaces, it's very subtle, of course, for infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, it appears physically also singular. So you can actually use X and X tilde in a completely covariant form. Here, I hark back to Q and P, but you can think of X tilde as an independent dual space-time label, and you can covariantize everything. So you can use your space-time uh, structure to construct the sort of the operators, these U's and V's in the covariant form. Uh, you can also add uh, the ODD structure that comes out from the fact that you have sort of a lattice and dual lattice, et cetera. Now, by the way, the vacuum here, I'm not going to discuss is also defined relative to the observer. This will be very important when we discuss later strength. Now in quantum field theory, what usually happens is you take the Schrodinger, at least for free fields, and then you sort of quant second quantize, at least for free fields. That's possible, that goes back to Dirac. And then we introduce quantum fields as basically operators, but operators depends on classical labels. And we define path integrals, et cetera. And the quantum, these quantum fields are particles and antiparticles. The world line action is defined by px dot minus n p squared plus m squared, where p squared plus m squared is the energy dispersion relation fixed essentially by Lorentz symmetry relativity. And we have particles and antiparticles. Now in the second quantized modular approach, obviously you have phi of x and x tilde. That was the Zach polarization. So therefore the operators in quantum field theory properly should be defined with double labels. Remember these other labels you can think of if you were to think about measurement problem, which is never addressed, right, explicitly, you always have to introduce some environment, couple to environment, integrate, it's a whole song and dance to doc coherence. But this is an intrinsic label, right, that addresses measurement without any classical limit, okay, or some crazy interpretations that, um, you know, violet Occam's razor, like uh, whatever, many world or something like this. This is intrinsically quantum. So you introduce an operator, which is now defined, essentially, it's a non-commutative one field, but you see it's covariant because X is covariant label, X tilde is covariant, but X, X tilde do not commute. That means that they can always pick a polarization X and go into the usual polarization that they use in the textbook quantum field theory, but I have an infinite many others. Okay, so now basically the fields in principle have to be double and there will be double RG that knows both about UV and IR. The fixed points are generically self-dual. Okay, and uh, if you want to introduce fields, background fields, you just basically shift P and P tildes, uh, as we'll do with gauge symmetry. Okay, so now we have a prediction. 
The prediction is the quanta of this field and dual fields, right, are essentially fixed by Born geometry, and they're what we call metaparticles. Essentially, you will see they're little strings. Okay, there's zero modes of the string properly formulated in this intrinsic quantum geometry. And all particles should have their duals and they're correlated in that way. And um, that will be also true for the whole standard model. And the claim will be that the, the sort of correlated duals in some sense are the dark degrees of freedom. So you have PX dot, you have a P tilde X dot, you have a lambda PP tilde dot, very much bare, very phase-like if you want, okay, set by omega. Uh, you have two constraints, one Hamiltonian that's set by the double metric, P squared plus P tilde squared plus M squared. And then you have this ODD constraint, PP tilde is mu. There's a new parameter. If mu goes to zero, P tilde goes to zero, you get an ordinary particle, particle that exists in energy E. Now there is actually a hidden T duality here. As I said, there's a zero modes of the string. So essentially there's a kind of like a dual particle mu over E. And that's presumably why we don't see them easily. You can do the propagator, and the propagator is given like this. It's consistent with neutrality of causality. You can actually go in a particular gauge, which let's say P tilde is uh, just a vector, let's say it's space-like. You can actually get this dispersion relation. There's no violation of Lorentz. This is just fixing a gauge. It's like going to Lycon gauge in the usual, um, for the usual dispersion relation. However, there's an interesting phenomenological consequence because this tells you that for E goes to zero in the infrared, because of this mu parameter, you might find some interesting physics. And that's what we did recently, taking curved background. You could take a black hole background, by the way, as well. Okay, And if you take cosmology, right, in this particular case, you can parameterize all of this dispersion relation. You find out that the representation theory is different. Okay, so now you have to basically look at what are the Casimirs. There are three Lorentz bearing Casimirs, P squared plus P tilde squared, P P tilde, and P tilde squared minus P squared. So you have to be very careful what you mean by mass. Okay, this is what the usual mass here with this delta parameter essentially parameterizes this um, representations. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to go into technicalities there. And then I just don't want to write the whole representation theory, but let me write one particular in which basically this parameter mu is essentially bounded by what you would call this m, uh, uh, m, m um, uh, under um, uh, m, let's say, bar squared. Um, um, and, uh, and then basically you find out that in the early late universe for a goes to zero, this is FRW, a goes to infinity, either um, the p tilde modes are non-zero or p tilde more goes to zero. In other words, there is a toggling seesaw between visible and if you want the dark matter sector. Uh, particles. And so this is now a precise in principle prediction, the infrared prediction for people who want to do quantum gravity phenomenology, let's say LIGO or multi-messenger astronomy. Now the phenomenology here, the simplest one that we could think of is take the massive case. Massless is always subtle, as you know, right? Because you have a little group and you have to do the representation theory for that, and etc. But if you take the lightest massive things, which are neutrinos, this is a cosmological bound, then essentially get the, the mu for neutrinos. Uh, is close to sort of dark energy scale. Now, uh, mu is different for different standard model particles. And in principle, the whole standard model would have this door or if you want dark standard model, okay? Now you can compute the static potential by basically inverting the propagator and you get this. It's not a Coulombic potential, it's modulated by sums of consigns. And that maybe reminds you of some things that you've seen in Condes Matter books, which is called the Friedel oscillations, uh, not like my, uh, collaborator for Dell, but uh, F-R-I-E-T-E-L, right? And they've been measured and so forth, well-known phenomena in condensed matter physics. Uh, here, the mu parameter would basically essentially uh, 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 be related to the Fermi surface. I also feel that the propagator will appear in the context of quasi-particles. And I just last uh, uh, week went to Urbana uh, a workshop on strange particles, uh, on, on strange metals. I'm saying, I think these metaparticles do uh, appear in that context. And that's something to be worked out. Anyway, quantum field theory and metaparticles, well, write this first uh, order of word line Lagrangian, right? Uh, uh, shift the momenta by the gauge symmetry, right? And now you get basically, if you want an effective action, which explicitly goes beyond effective field theory. This is not like a dark photon, because a dark photon will have F squared, it will have an F tilde squared, right? You will have FF tilde. But here you have a coupling that obvious in effective field theory is zero, because lambda is taken to zero in effective field theory, and it's kind of topological, very face-like. 
So what is quantum gravity? From the ground, quantum gravity from this point of view is dynamic Coborn geometry. And I want to like to claim that this is actually string theory. Again, everything is fixed by geometry. Just let's make omega, eta, and h dependent on x. So if you do that, and you just basically uh, geometrize one, this uh, minimal length by an extra parameter sigma, so instead of having uh, x dot p, uh, where dot is now delta, you're going to have delta x, del sigma x. Instead of having p squared with h a b, which defines the vacuum, you have a del sigma x, del sigma x. x is a doublet of x and x tilde. Now, it turns out if you integrate over x tilde, this is just the polyco path integral, if omega is neglected, right? And it's a, otherwise it relates to something which is called double field theory, but in that case, omega does not exist, okay? Now, this meta string is essentially bosonic, it's chiral. You see, it's chiral phase space like a double, it's non commutative. And in principle, x and x tilde do not commute. The zero modes of the meta string you can prove, and they are the edge modes that uh, John mentioned in this particular case. They essentially, the string is decomposed into left and right movers. The sum of left and right is essentially what you call the usual x. The difference of left and right is this dual space time from the stringy point of view. The string realizes this quantum geometry, and that answers maybe a Jopochinsky question is that the string theory is there because the intrinsic geometry of quantum theory, quantum mechanics, okay, which is based on combination non-locality fundamental length and causality, which is the Born geometry, is the geometry of the string in a full dynamical form. The limits of the zero modes of the matter string are not particles, but these matter particles that are discovered. The background of the string is not the classical space-time, except in the singular limit, but the modular space-time. And the observables of the string, the vertex sampleries, are representation of the wild Heisenberg algebra. They're modular variables. And this is an interesting uh, technical point. String people know that they have to deal with uh, co-cycles when they combine, let's say, uh, look at algebra vertex operators as a string on a circle. And these co-cycles are always, in some sense, fixed arbitrarily. These co-cycles are signs of intrinsic non-commutativity. If you do the representation of Weil Heisenberg correctly in the modular variable and treat vertex operators of the string as modular variables, okay, and give a modular space-time as the background for the string, and write this meta string uh, action that I wrote on the previous page, okay? Then uh, fully non commutative, chiral, et cetera, bosonic, then you basically have no cross cycles. So effective non commutativity essentially is an explicit relative locality. You can mix X and X tilde, like you can boost, right, in special relativity. Now you can uh, mix space time and dual space time, and string backgrounds do that. That's where the Colbramon comes about. Colbramon is essentially originate from non-commutativity of the string, from omega AB, okay? And it gives you an explicit uh, uh, non-commutativity of the tilde variables. Now notice this algebra is known in open string sector, but this is in the closed string, kind of rewritten from the open string point of view, from the left and right X and X tilde point of view, all right? In 4D, of course, B is dual to axioms, all right? Now, there's a new no commutativity where you do the other locality, right? And you find the space time is completely non commutative, and you have kind of dual to the B mu nu field, B upper mu nu. And that non commutativity, exactly like the non commutativity that we get in the open string sector in the presence of D brains. Okay, D brains, by the way, here can be uh, described as a Lagrangian sort of sub manifolds in this chiral uh, uh, formulation. Um, anyway, so. Uh, uh, if you were to put the uh, this into phenomenology and say like, well, look, my string actually predicts this. What is the bound on this beta AB? There is a phenomenological bound. People have done this. There's a famous paper, Al Kostrelecki, Jeff Harvey, Sean Carroll, and others from 20 years ago. And essentially, it's the bound of that given by LHC, uh, central mass energy of 10 TED. In principle, notice, if you have varying B, the same is true for Calbramon field, which gives you the H background then in principle, we have non-associativity. And this non-associativity actually is very important. This, so in general, this geometry is, the full geometry of the string is non-commuted, non-associative, because as some of you know, there is a very deep relation between the standard model gauge uh, group and the Octonians. This also extends uh, further, I think, and we were discussing this with Tristan and Pear as we speak. Uh, and I think the standard model comes out as a very 
particular, not just arbitrary, but very unique feature of the non-associative, fully non-associative geometry of this quantum modular space-time. Now, quantum gravity from this point of view, you see, is uh, uh, atomic. So you build space-time from modular cells. What is this modular cell? So in principle, one-dimensional modular cell is just two-dimensional torus. But just take the whole bosonic string and compactify all 26 dimensions. Now you would say like, well, but that's 25 plus one, I'm gonna have close time-like loops, but you don't because time is modular. All of these things are modular now, okay? And in principle, you can also define non-perturbative gravity uh, by thinking about modular growth sheet and then having tau tilde and sigma tilde coordinates, which you can basically dualize into matrices. And here is an example sort of matrix quantum theory, which should define, and I'm not putting traces here because this is really an operatorial in the sense of Born, Heisenberg, uh, Jordan, if you want uh, definition of uh, non-perturbative definition, if you want, of uh, a matter string from this and quantum gravity from this point of view. George, okay, a little minutes. bit about, sorry? Five minutes, George. Okay, so a little bit about dark matter, dark energy from the Einstein uh, equations, right? What people, what we have discovered 20 years ago, Adam Reese and, uh, and others, uh, 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 is the uh, uh, dark energy, right? Uh, essentially is the cosmological constant divided by G Newton and the T mu nu, right? The energy momentum tensor, the Einstein equation is sort of visible, the standard model and something that we need for cosmology in particular structure formation, right? Uh, to generate structure, which is some energy momentum tensor, some dark sector. But now we are basically claiming that uh, there should be essentially standard model, maybe fixed by the geometry of the, a non-associated geometry of, of string theory and the dual uh, standard model, which is then the dark sector. What about um, uh, uh, dark matter? To leading order, let's understand this. The effective action, you see it's double, square root of G, G tilde, L uh, matter, XF tilde, L dark matter of XF tilde, because you have fields and, and dual fields. You integrate over dual space-time. Let's suppose that they are not to leading order correlated, we can basically uh, ignore the non-commutativity. And then essentially you get effective action, which would be the standard model and the dual the dark matter uh, 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 action, which is essentially dual standard model. Okay, so particle and the dual particle united in the zero modes of the string. So that's actually a prediction, if you want, uh, of string theory. The dark matter phenol, which is very interesting to me here, is that the dark matter is correlated to visible matter because particles are correlated to uh, 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 their, their duals into this meta particle. And that essentially some data from galaxies and actually from clusters and even maybe super clusters um, point out to correlation that there is some type of universal acceleration that people who do not believe in dark matter, by the way, trust very much on the level of galaxies. But I think this is a feature of, uh, of lambda CDM sharpened from this point of view, and that there is a universal acceleration essentially set by the dark energy. But what is dark energy in this context? Well, do the same thing to the leading order in lambda to the gravity sector. So now you have integral square root of g, g tilde, r plus r tilde plus dot, dot, dot. Again, to leading order lambda. Integrate over dual space time. Well, integral square root of minus g tilde is going to give you g newton, but integral over square root of minus g tilde, r tilde, is going to give you g newton lambda. So you have a cosmological constant. The geometry, the dual geometry integrated over is a cosmological constant. Um, if you wanted to just include, uh, ex, uh, uh, pull out the volume of the dual part, V tilde, um, uh, and uh, relate V and V tilde, they're correlated in terms of alpha prime, I'm writing as one, V, V tilde one, and just integrate out, replace by V tilde. This was actually done by Zaitlin some years ago, but without non-commutativity and all this meta string and so forth, you essentially get this non-extensive formula if you were to vary that action as tilde, you would actually find out that you can get flat space and the sitter space with a cosmological constant tunable to zero at tree level, okay, tree level, okay, but no end the ADS space. This is actually not explicitly, I think, probably breaking a, a supersymmetry. And this is consistent with something that Tristan and Pear and I realize in some other uh, context, uh, which is called the CISO formula. Essentially, the scale that, that sets the cosmological constant as bar is related inversely to the scale that sets the, uh, that where, where we have integral square root of minus g, which is the Planck scale, and they toggle about some intermediate scale. As you all know, that intermediate scale numerically is just a uh, TeV. Now, the claim here would be that essentially the effective action that you get from this non-commutative description to leading order is some sequester action, so you can stabilize this 
at, uh, at loops perturbatively, not just at tree level. And the CC is naturally small, but you can do from doing the vacuum energy, but now using both the dual degrees of freedom. In other words, having a cutoff that goes to the fourth power and then the dual power, right? Uh, because lambda, lambda, tilde is mu. That's the ODD constraint, right? And that exactly looks like M lambda equals M squared over M. In general, you have a dynamical CC with Vishnu and Tatsu and Mikovic, we're talking about this. There are statistical effects uh, uh, of quantum gravity. It's probably a new approach to vacuum selection. We'll be discussing with Yang, Vishnu, and John Antonio Argiades, and et, et cetera. Summary. OK, I've walked you. I know this is a mouthful. <laughs> From quantum mechanics, uh, quantum modular space time is a sort of special quantum relativity and revealed a new geometry of quantum theory called Born geometry. And when applied to quantum field theory, it leads to prediction of something called metaparticles, the world action of which world uh, line action completely fixed by this quantum born geometry. Okay, that also tells us that there is something more to be said about inferent divergences and definitely quantum measurement problem and probably quantum information, quantum fields, uh, quantum field theory just from this point of view. And then if you push that to quantum gravity again, just use born geometry, fix everything essentially by the structure, you find out string theory, but written in a bosonic, chiral, phase space-like doubled, a non-commutative and actually even non-associative form. Okay, and that I think tells us something about dark matter and dark, dark energy. And the phenomenology is that quantum gravity does have something to say about the infrared because of this deformed dispersion relation, deformed static potential, and the dark matter is correlated to visible matter and dark energy. And essentially dark energy does have some type of seesaw relation where the infrared scale and the ultraviolet scales are related by the intermediate scale of the matter sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, George. Any questions? I have no questions. Contraction is very similar to the uh, double phase theory. And then, in general, can we, can we take a strong, a strong contract limit? Uh, then we do not, we should not go back to a standard slow gravity. Then we should lose the uh, non commutativity. But in, your, in the conventional rule, we still have a non commutativity between the X and the, the tilde. So, hence, I think uh, that even if we have a conventional rule for, uh, for uh, non commutativity, non-commutativity, which we may not have a non-commutative property. Uh, I'm not sure I completely understood the question. Uh, you were talking about double field theory? Yeah, uh, it's similar to double field theory. Okay, in double field theory, in generically, first of all, you don't have this X and X tilde. You see X and X tilde commute, right? So you have a double geometry, but you're, you don't have this non-commutativity or double space time. Look, this is the textbook version of string theory. The textbook version of string theory is we assume a space time interpretation. We say that X and X tilde commute. Therefore, X tilde does not have any new information. Okay, X tilde could ap appear when you take the string on a circle or something like this. And in that case, you get this co-cycles I told you about, and then you just fix them by being smart. You know, like Joe Polchinski has a smart argument in his book. In every book, you'll find some argument. Now, if you look at that co-cycle, okay, it's exactly that non-commutativity factor I talked about. It's exactly. Contains KK prime, let's say for two e to the ikx, e to the ik prime, x prime, so forth. You get a KK prime minus K prime, whatever, tilde K, delta. And that's exactly that non-commutativity. What we are say, saving, say, uh, saying is, if you define the observables properly, okay, then you have a non commutative, right? Uh, uh, properly in the sense that they are representations of some algebra. What algebra? The algebra of the underlying fields, X and X tilde. So if I give you that algebra, X and X tilde is not commuting, then I'm studying representation of Heisenberg Weil, and I do not have co cycles then. Then I have to live with non commutativity. One reason why we have the Kolbramon field in string theory is because Kolbramon field is an example of that non commutativity. You know what you do? You take the simple uh, symplectic form from classical physics, zero minus one, one, zero, and you just ODD rotate it and you yes. get a B okay, field. So you see, the B field is essentially 
uh, there because of the of the face space structure, and it just yeah. you know we uh, this is a completely uh, complete reinterpretation or or rethinking if you want of the foundation of string theory. From this point of view, all sorts of things that you think are necessary in string theory are not necessary. They're just essentially fine tuned emergent limits of the string, but they're not generic like supersymmetry or holography and so forth. And what I'm saying here is that we all know that supersymmetry can get from the, from the bosonic string. Just think how you construct the heterotic string or 2A, 2B and so forth, right? So this, essentially bosonic string is our really true M theory in this form formulation. All the other things, the M theory, whatever they are, they are emergent aspects of this formulation where you fine tune your uh, RG trajectory, if you want to call it, in this uh, uh, non commutative uh, formulation, and then you add as something that looks like supersymmetric dimension. Similar holography, it assumes classical space time, but the string tells you I have a doubled one. As a matter of fact, even quantum mechanics tells you this. So you see, we I always fine tune. I I think 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 about, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Very similar to the Tissonese uh, double, double signal model. I think the model also has the non commutativity between the X and the tilde. Uh, in some particular cases, like WZW cases, etc., but not generically. Yeah, see, so, done everything generic. They don't have born geometry. Born uh, geometry yeah, is an yeah, for your case, of course. But in the, in the double signal model, I can only take the strong constraint to go back to the sigma model. So this is my question. If I, I, I have this limit to go back to the sigma model, but I still have a rule uh, for non commutativity uh, Sorry, I cannot understand. There's a lot of background there, and I, I, I just I just cannot understand. I know that you're saying some, asking something about the sigma model, but I, I, I'm not getting the sentence. Okay, maybe maybe we can talk about email. Maybe yeah, maybe okay. you can send me an email. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Are there other questions? I, I don't know if there is time, but uh, George, I, I wanted to ask you if the if in your picture, uh, do you have any comments about the tensionless limit of the string in, in your in your picture? Uh, this is a wonderful thing because when we started talking about this at that time people were you know our first paper was 2013 that was the time that people were talking about tensionless uh right. strength and we were talking about some type of duality between you know tension um at the moment you see we kind of dropped that question but i okay. think it will come about let me tell you how i think it comes about so the, this meta string that i wrote essentially only contains quadratic operators but you can think of from the point of view of effective field theory in the world sheet uh -huh. And so you can turn on high order operators. Then the tension, I think, will run. I mean, we know an example of that in the usual Polyakov string. If I turn on the term, which is x box squared x, which is the extrinsic curvature term, the Polyakov yes. term, right? That makes the tension run, run to one loop, right? Yeah. So yeah. I think these high order terms are crucial if you want to think about QCD string and so forth. I'm getting uh, back to my origins, you know, yeah, I got the string right, right, because right. of QCD. Yeah, and, and, so, and so I think, I think essentially the high order terms, once you turn on, once you start thinking more generically about the meta string action, okay, you will get this. And, and this is a presumably interesting story. For me, the clearest story about tension and string is what Rob has done with Onkar and friends. Uh, uh, went back because you see they essentially rewrote the exact uh, RG the Wilson Polchinski from the free field point of view, taking a vector model on the boundary with an infinite number of derivatives. This is the boundary theory, and then rewriting it precisely in the bulk. And they really got the ADS emerge, the Witten diagrams emerge. I mean, it's all from RG. It's beautiful. Okay, I'm not sure it it completely matches the Vasiliev theory. And um, at some point they dropped it because, you know, a, a field moved on and, you know, it becomes technically prohibited. But I think it will be uh, maybe revived now from the point of view of the effective string theory. Thank so you. I think this is a great question. It was one of the original questions we asked. We dropped it, but I think we are coming back to it. No, no, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for your comments. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your question. 
So 